George Zimmerman's defense team has now released uh, videotapes of uh, Zimmerman walking the cops through the scene the day after the shooting and giving his side of the story. Here's Good Morning America with more. In this video shot by investigators just one day after 17-year-old Trayvon Martin's death, George Zimmerman is brought to the scene of the incident to reenact what happened. And my head was on the cement and he just kept slamming that slamming. Zimmerman says he fears for his life. It felt like my head was going to explode and I thought I was going to lose consciousness. During the nearly 20-minute reenactment, Zimmerman describes right how the fight here. began, blow yeah. by blow, depicting Martin as the aggressor. He said, yo, you got a problem? And I turned around and I said, no, I don't have a problem, man. Remember, that's the guy who chased him uh, down with a gun. So all of a sudden, he's the innocent guy. What? What? I don't have a problem. Oh, I just chased you down with a gun. What's the problem? Now, of course, we'd love to get Trayvon's uh, version of these events, but he was shot to death by George Zimmerman. By the way, Zimmerman is uh, shorter than Trayvon. Uh, Trayvon was 5'11", and Zimmerman's 5'8". But Zimmerman outweighed him significantly, 200 pounds apparently to 158 pounds. That's the guy that's apparently doing so much damage to him, according to Zimmerman's side of the story. Now, Good Morning America has more. And I, I fell down, he pushed me down, somehow he got on top of me. He says he screams for help. He put his hand on his nose, no, on my nose, and his other hand on my mouth. He says, shut up. He later tells investigators he feels Martin is winning the struggle. He says it's at that moment that Martin spots his gun. I feel like he saw it, he looked at it, and he said, you're going to die tonight. And he reached for it, but he reached, like I felt his arm going down to my side, and I grabbed it, and I just grabbed my firearm, and I shot him. Now, the original uh, lead investigator in the case did not believe Zimmerman's version of events. And, of course, later uh, he was overruled by the police chief, and then the police chief was recently fired. You know how all that went down, and now we're at a trial. Uh, also, that reenactment had several problems. In order to talk about that, let's bring in our own expert here. Luis uh, Bolianos has a 30-year career in law enforcement, including Riverside County Sheriff, FBI, DEA, Riverside County DA's office, and now leads uh, the Bo Bolianos investigation team. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, now, uh, first of all, have you done these kind of uh, investigations where you bring the guy in and he reenacts it for you? Absolutely, I have. I've been involved in about a dozen of them. Okay. And uh, did they follow proper protocol here or no? Well, not any protocol that I've been familiar with and I was taught here in California. Um, they may have a reason for doing it that way. Uh, they seemed extremely short. They had an opportunity to get one bite, at the, they had one bite at that apple and I don't think they took a full bite. That's interesting. What would you have done differently? Well, um, I'm sure if you compare what they did at the reenactment to how the interview went part of this at the station, you're going to see a significant amount of time difference. Uh, it seemed to be rushed through it. I want detail, detail upon detail. And I think they didn't ask more than a dozen questions. Uh, he did most of the talking. Again, they may have a reason for doing that. Um, I want him to fizz. First of all, I want someone to play the part of Zimmerman and someone to play the part of Mr. Martin. Uh, hmm. We should have Mr. Martin put... Uh, Mr. Zimmerman put Mr. Martin on the ground exactly uh, where he was, physically straddle him, show exactly how he was sitting on him, where the hands were, how that transitioned from one position, one position to another. Uh, Lewis, is the reason you do that because you might find out more discrepancies if they're actually showing you literally what happened? Absolutely. You, you could do a, a verbal interview in the station to, for someone to, to volunteer probably with uh, authorization from his attorney, to go out into the field and do that on video, a physical reenactment re of the crime, uh, very rare. Right. So now let's go back to some of the tape we just saw, and I want you to look at it and uh, comment on it. Let's, let's roll the first one here. It felt like my body was on the grass and my head was on the cement, and he just kept slamming it, slamming it. And uh, I, just, I kept yelling, help, help his hand on his nose, no, on my nose, and his other hand on my mouth, he said, shut the f up. It, it, there's so many things that are weird about that. Why would the guy who was being chased down want the other guy to shut up? Like, he, since Trayvon was the one being pursued in the beginning, I don't, there's something off with that uh, account, but what's, what's your take on, on what was happening? I, I agree with you completely. It appears that Mr. Zimmerman here is making himself out to be a victim to more 
to a much a major degree. Right. Uh, he claims that he, Zimmer, or Mr. Barton, had him on the ground by the head, slamming his head on the concrete over and over again. He claims that uh, Mr. Barton had his hand over Mr. Zimmerman's mouth and his nose, uh, attempting to suffocate him. Again, you know, he's in dis he's in danger. Uh, he's trying to make himself look like the victim here. Louis, is he saying that maybe to establish some sort of defense there? Like, my, I thought my life was in danger because he was trying to, what, suffocate me? That's what he's making it sound like. It sounds like he was coached. Now, Yeah, that's weird. You know. Like, I've never seen somebody in a fight just try to like put the hand over the mouth and the nose. Is that something that's common that I'm not aware of? I've never seen that, especially with the size difference. It just doesn't make any sense. That's interesting. So, you know, to that point, they do this the day after the shooting, right? I don't know if that's normal or not. Is it normal? Yeah, two to three days afterwards, the sooner the better. Right, okay, so th that's fine. But in this case, Zimmerman's dad is a judge. Wouldn't he talk to his dad before he goes and does the reenactment? And couldn't his dad tell him, hey, listen, here's what you need to prove, and so you might want to say this and this? Uh, you better believe that happened. And if not, his dad at least uh, pointed him in the direction of his favorite attorney. Right. So, God, that's another huge problem. All right, now let's take a look at the other piece of uh, tape that we showed you. Watch. That's when my jacket had moved up, and I had my, my firearm on my right side hip. My jacket moved up, and he saw it. I feel like he saw it, he looked at it, and he said, you're gonna die tonight, and he reached for it, but he reached, like I felt his arm going down to my side, and I grabbed it, and I just grabbed my firearm, and I shot him one time. So what's your take on that, Luce? He's trying to make it look that as soon as uh, he believes that Mr. Martin identified he had a firearm on him, that the struggle was on. It all became about a battle for the firearm. So he had to do what he needed to do to save his own life. Did you get a sense that, that, you know, as you were saying earlier, that he looks almost too coached? Do you, can you tell that as you're doing an investigation? Is there a point where you go, wait a minute, that's not how a real person would break this down? Uh, you know, it seems like he's trying to present a case almost? I'm sure, you'd, uh, from experience, and that seems to be what's going on here. I mean, it's always the exception, but uh, my guess is he was coached. That's interesting. Okay, so how do you how do you uh, determine if you believe him or not? Because ultimately, look, the jury's going to look at this and go, "I got to make sure this guy's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt." And it's really tough because he's the only sign of the story we have because the other person is dead. So, if you were the investigator there, how would you challenge him to make sure that he's telling the truth or not? Well, I would compare what he's saying here with the interview he gave at the station. Um, right. You know, and again, that's going to be a good two or three hour interview. It's got to be, not a 20 minute recap. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's going to be holes in that. Right. And then the jacket, how much of a difference with that? He didn't have a jacket there, but he did that night. Does that make a big difference? Yes. I'd, in a perfect scenario, I'd love to have him do that reenactment with the jacket on. He comes across a point here where he actually uh, points to where somebody was yelling at him, noticed what was going on. He raises his arm, indicating that that's when the weapon was exposed. Well, I'd like to know if that's even possible. Right. And there you see him with the red jacket, of course. And, uh, and I guess we won't find out because that's not how they did it. All right, uh, Luis, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you.